Mr. Wardlock, uh, good morning, welcome to morning. the District Attorney's uh, 2024 to 2028 Capital Improvement Plan and Public Hearing. Um, City Planning heard these um, hearings every year at the beginning of capital budget planning process uh, to provide more public visibility to Tom and Agency's capital requests for the upcoming five years and to allow um, any opportunity for public comment at the meeting or you know, uh, later on during the process. What we've been asking uh, uh, departments to do in these meetings is to um, go through the capital request, um, get a brief description of the project that you're requesting, any delays, and how those can be really accomplished overall, kind of a five year vision for what you're trying to accomplish with this request. Um, I appreciate the start with the round of introductions. I'm Larry Rossi, uh, Deputy Director of the City Planning Department. Uh, Dave Smith, Director of Capital Planning. Uh, Keith Lampkin, Chief of Operations and Internal Affairs, uh, New Orleans, uh, Orleans Parish Community Office. Jacob Rowland, Project Manager, Capital Project Administration. Sandra McAuliffe, I'm the Account Manager, Account Agency, Public Affairs and Planning. Jason Lewis, Chief Financial Officer. Evan Fleming, Director of Community Director, uh, OPD Director. Thank you. Uh, Jason Lewis, Chief Awesome. Thank you guys so much uh, for this opportunity. All, for all the help uh, as we got prepared for this. And, uh, just to let you guys know ahead of time, we're going to be leaning on you a little bit more as we, uh, as we push this thing across the river plate. Um, you know, this is a, a great opportunity for us to, to recalibrate. Uh, you know, we're a few years on the other side of the pandemic, and it really helps maintain what we've already got, but also anticipate the growing nature of caseloads and the pace and, and the bodies that are needed to, to respond to what we see as an evolving uh, pattern of criminality. Um, so um, I'll hop right in. Um, this year's proposal is substantially similar to what we did last year, but it does account for necessary uptick and in inflation for labor and, and materials. Um, uh, I, I will be uh, referring a little bit to Jacob as we go through this on some of the specifics here. But uh, you know, uh, you know, really everything that we're doing today is about both having a place that uh, you know, shows the respect and, and the, uh, the reverence for community, the victims and witnesses we serve, um, and also our, our staff who work uh, long hours. Uh, you know, it's a thankless job in many ways, and, and many people never get the visibility that they need. But we, we definitely want to make sure that while they're in a, our building, they've got a safe, uh, comfortable place to work. Um, and when we're inviting the public into our offices, which is a constant wait, all day, every day. We want to make sure that uh, that that impression of, of safety and comfort uh, sort of welcomes them when they come through the door. Um, obviously, at some point or another, all of us are going to be touched by the system if we haven't already. Even if it's not directly, it's going to be a neighbor or family member, or classmate. Um, but at some point, most people are going to have to enter our building, uh, the courthouse, or another one of those public safety agencies on that compound. And we just want to make sure that we are. Uh, hitting that tenet of the master plan that requires us to have a state of the art uh, a public safety facility for uh, not just the physical work that's got to do, but, but, but also for the, the, the mental impression that they need to get that provided. Um, I'll start with those more physical infrastructure components uh, of our pitch. Uh, the, the first of which I think is a pretty uh, self explanatory, which is a fence enclosure uh, for a parking lot. Um, we have right now about uh, four uh, means of access uh, to our port parking lot. Um, we're surrounded on all sides by both other buildings that relate to public safety, but we've got a heavy residential and commercial presence uh, in that group. That's the one corridor um, at that corner of South Light as well. So, you know, for anybody who uh, is able to cross over the invisible barrier uh, that, that surrounds that building right now, uh, they can get pretty direct access to the three entry points that we've got uh, to our office. Um, you know, as of, you know, luckily we have not uh, recently had any instances of uh, uh, compromised public safety, but, you know, we see people coming to and fro all day. And, and certainly it's hot, so everybody's going to take the shortest route to wherever they've got to go. Um, and so many people who are coming into our parking lot, they come directly by our employee entrance, which is the you know, drive-in entrance to our parking lot. 
and all sort of back and forth instance with our ADA investigators, social workers, just going back and forth all day. Um, you know, and uh, unfortunately, uh, an inconvenient truth of our job is that we have to see people every day. We have to hold people accountable for things that they do, which usually means that you know somebody's not going to be too happy, and that also means that that family might not be too happy, and other people are connected to uh, the subject of prosecution. So we really want to make sure that as our uh, our staff are going and coming, they've got safe means to do that, and also as we're escorting the victims and serve and their families, we want to make sure that, uh, again, that, that security is ever present uh, for them. So we believe that um, a, a fence enclosure for the whole perimeter of our building will uh, give us more control of our space, uh, more predictability about who the people are who are uh, walking around and, and into our building. Um, and also sends a, a clear signal, I believe, to uh, anyone who might wish to do something or think about it, right, that, you know, this is a protected space. Um, and I think that's important again for, for our, our staff as they're going back and forth today. Um, the next is here. Oh, sorry. Can I ask a question? Sure. About this? Um, is part of this parking lot, or at least part of what seems to be this parking lot, uh, also used for zoning? Um, yes. And would this project include the Gray parking lot as well? Yes, yes. Um, and we would love for, and, and you know, it's, it's a bit of mixed use, right? For us in the court, both uh, rely upon it for jurors who are going to go in uh, to be a part of the jury veneer, uh, and also our grand jurors uh, who come in for, uh, they, they, they park in there right now, getting ready to start um, our uh, weekly grand jury sessions right now. So um, we do, you, you know, so a uh, great question, Larry, because it will require that um, if we do surround it, that court personnel have <coughs> some means to be sure that jurors are still able to get there. Um, what we've been doing right now is we'll have one of our investigators down there uh, early in the morning, uh, which, which is very uh, uncomfortable right now, right? But we'll have someone down there doing their best to vet who's coming in and why they're why they're coming in, and you know, check to see if they're a grand jury, uh, juror or, or juror, and um, you know, just do the best with what you've got right now. So, um, but but that is a good question. We have to account for uh, the court having access. We've got a great working relationship, so I've got no. Uh, doubt that, that that's something that would be easy to obtain for uh, well, this is also something that they requested Certainly. in their in their request right right absolutely um and, and you know a happy juror is a good juror oh yeah we, we want people to sit on juries we need people to be able to make these cases uh, and, and volunteer so they would so we want to make that as uh, as seamless as possible for them um moving to the air handling units um uh, requested about 1.3 million for air you know, right now, uh, we uh, rely very heavily on that relationship with the court. Um, we've got gentleman Tony, who, uh, with property management, who, you know, is always a phone call away. Uh, but, you know, if on the second floor, it's a little hot, and on the, the, the fourth floor, it's a little cold, right? we got to call and ask him to tinker with it until we get to a point where uh, we're comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, there's all also necessary maintenance that just absolutely has to go into that system uh, because we hate to find ourselves in a situation like our, our good friends at NOPD, right? They're just returning. Uh, I cannot imagine the inconvenience that they've caused even for a short uh, period of time, but having no AC, and I understand that they had some earlier issues at the same time, which is a, a bit of a perfect storm. So whatever investment we can make uh, and continue on the investments we can make to be sure that we don't get to a situation where we have a complete shutdown uh, it would be a, a, a good bit for us, and again, we're talking staff and we're talking those victims and witnesses. Can you explain your your cost breakdown for that? You've got an equal distribution of funds starting in 2025. What is this right? So how we did it was the original project that we're bidding in August uh, was to replace all of the interior and interior in the building. Uh, I can't remember the count, but it's it's a lot. And um, so when we went back and had the BE, we identified the oldest, and so we're only replacing. Five or so of the interior units. Okay. We took the rest of them and just divided it evenly across the years, uh, it, assuming we would, you know, stage the replacement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that the total of that breakdown is it would be the cost that we had in it uh, mm -hmm. escorted to you know the current index, but uh, to replace all of the interior air handling units. Okay. <coughs> okay. Keep going. All right. So uh, 
the, the next thing is our ceiling grid uh, replacement. Um, and this is another one of those, those maintenance things that is both preventative and um, just, just make sure that we have something that's uh, not uh, aesthetically unpleasing. I know that all of these buildings at some point have uh, some issues with leaking and, and with uh, the, just the degradation of the quality uh, of the ceiling and ceiling roof. And, and this is just another one of those things that we want. We believe uh, making this investment in the ceiling grid prevents degradation of the other infrastructure into that building. It's um, the same strategy. It is. This is another piece that's you know designed for 75% of the needs. Um, so um, you know, we're, we are replacing the roof as part of the project mm -hmm. uh, throughout the building. You know, there's stained um, ceiling tiles, there's mold. Um, so they're replacing as they can, but you know, there's just gaps in the ceiling. And we also need to redesign the ceiling a little bit to account for the cubicles that we're going to be putting in. There's all these different kind of lighting design. Um, you know, that we basically have to you know eschew with this project. So this would this would kind of tie in the ceiling to line up with the new um, you know, ceiling mm -hmm. they're building. Okay, and then we jump to uh, uh, number six, and uh, we go back to three and Absolutely, and, and my apologies, Mr. Smith. I, I was going through those more physical uh, uh, infrastructure pieces of it, and then I was going to get to surveillance, IT, uh, et cetera, if that's all right. Um, uh, and, and I'll just, you know, sort of. Okay. Well, no, I'll tell you what, Dan. You go ahead, we'll follow. Okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, so, so moving to the, uh, the skylight replacement, mm -hmm. um, uh, Jacob did just touch on this uh, a little bit, but, you know, we have, uh, you know, we, for any of you guys who've been in there, we've got you know, these glass panels uh, at the top. And what we've seen is that, you know, every time we get a significant amount of rain is that you get uh, pretty significant drippage, uh, and, and the evidence is there. If you walk in today, you will see the white streaks, uh, the water marks uh, from, from what's just been dripping through. Uh, I got to give it up to our staff because uh, on the third floor where this water drips to, it's directly over the, the break room area and it's in the cubicles. And our people have gotten especially crafty and put the, the, the pot. Into a water. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they put the pot exactly where it needs to be. It's like, oh, I smell rain. But they, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like clockwork, you know, when it rains, we'll, we'll look down and somebody's already kind of nudged the, the, the plan or the pot there. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're working with what we've got, but but it would be great uh, for uh, that not to have to be a part of our general operating procedure when it just rains. And property management has attempted to, you know, like seal it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I want to introduce our, our chief of staff, Micah Entz. Uh, all right. Uh, no, no, uh, and we're uh, and so Jacob touched on a little bit of the, the, the first floor uh, update, uh, but we are trying to make better use of our space. Uh, there was a, uh, I think, a significant uh, remodel to the, the front of that space uh, prior to our administration. Um, and we've got a, a wall right now that separates our reception space from our workspace. And what it's shown us is that, you know, for anybody who had been in there before that wall was built, it was kind of one big place that blended together. But now we can really make use uh, of that additional space that we got. And, you know, while we're in a uh, similar recruitment and retention area as most of our other uh, partner agencies, we have been pleased that we've been able to staff up to where people are asking for desk space right mm -hmm. now. And we've got good uh, interns and clerks who come in. Who we, we usually have to co-locate. It's kind of a part of that, that that pledging process where you you know you get you know crammed in together to pull that thread. Point where there's not many more sardines that we can put in this can. So uh, we, we'd love to be able to make better use of our space uh, on the first floor to you know again better serve our staff and both serve our clients as well. Has this is this going to require a plan? Is that done? Seventy-five percent. Yeah, so we had uh, not only aesthetics, but we had kind of re, re um, configured how the security, mm -hmm. the secure entrance works. Uh, right now, it's just kind of a buzz in through a window, um, and so this is a little more involved to kind of mimic what the court does with the detectors and things like that. So you've got soft costs included in this one as well. Okay. All right, and Mr. Smith, I'll go back up now to the surveillance camera system um, piece of things, and you know, much like you know where we started. This is one of those those safety pieces that, that we see as critical. Um, right now, we have 
have a, a, a functional camera system, but you know it's a specially economic. It's not uh, not not the fitting of, of the type of organization that we've got and, and with the, the various health uh, health and safety risks, right? Um, so you know we see this investment as, as super important, and this would be whether or not we get the next exposure. Um, we, we think a high quality camera system that uh, gives us the ability to see the, the full of the perimeter. We've got okay covers right now, but you know we've got blind spots that mm -hmm. uh, that, that could absolutely go into the flow. So uh, this investment uh, would, would go a long way again at, at that that sense of safety and that sense of comfort that uh, people feel with their time short off. Um, uh, moving on to IT and my apologies and questions on that. Okay, all right. IT infrastructure upgrades. Um, you know this one was definitely very important when it was initially proposed, but over the last several months it's become even more important. Um, this would get us fully integrated with the, the city's IT infrastructure, which would uh, very much allow uh, better patching, better um, seamless uh, data sharing. Um, as you guys know, the CAO has set aside significant dollars for upgrades to case management, jail management, um, and, and uh, information systems in, in the public safety area. Um, Nathaniel Weaver is in the process of working with experts to set up an enterprise service bus, which would allow us all to, you know, subscribe and, and publish information that's necessary for uh, our partners. Um, this infrastructure upgrade would absolutely facilitate uh, that being more seamless, right? Because right now we've got a bunch of systems that don't communicate with one another. Once we get the, the systems, uh, right, we're also going to need to be able to uh, to, to seamlessly access uh, for for uh, system upgrades, for cybersecurity, for, for for the like. So uh, we see this as one of those things that got even more critical uh, over the last few months, and uh, hopefully will be a serious consideration uh, for us going forward. And uh, finally, uh, I, as I walked in, I heard uh, our, our records manager, uh, Devin, talking a little bit about uh, the plight of our records retention and, and document storage. Uh, we have been uh, very pleased to be in uh, contact with Mr. Warren Smith in the part uh, uh, at MPDU. He has acknowledged exactly what you know Devin has been saying for the last uh, few years, that the cost of it what we're seeing right now is just not a sustainable clip. Uh, and, and, you know, the other thing is that there's some element of uh, unpredictability with what we're getting, right? You know, I, our people can go through and uh, run these equations and do the measurements and, and, and do the numbers based upon what's in our contract. And we're seeing a bit of a battle in what we have and what Iron Mountain has uh, in there. So, uh, and we understand that that, that more and more has been seen the same. Um, this proposal uh, contemplates that there could be city space uh, somewhere in uh, the city's portfolio that we might need for document storage, which gives us more agency over those documents. You know, as a prosecutor's office, we have some of the most stringent, um, some of the most uh, uh, you know, high obligations for document retention, destruction. Um, and we need to be able to access them at any time or a moment's notice. Um, you know, fast forward, you know, to 2023, and we've got pretty significant Supreme Court decisions and uh, legislation that has passed that's put us in a posture where cases that were long closed now have an opportunity to be revived. So we're now in a posture where we are constantly for not only the criminal component of those cases, but civil as well, having to request, you know, documents from decades ago or you know, file documents from decades ago. So um, this one is, is very important. You know, I know that as of right now, there's not many shows in town. Like we do with folks at the local, we have the present ability to, to deliver what we need uh, on a moment's notice. So, you know, we're kind of stuck looking at two, two vendors right now. If we could get to the point where you know, the city has some storage, even if it isn't all of our storage team, I think that would go a long way for us. Um, and again, not just the criminal justice system, but you know, we're dealing with contracts, CEAs, MOUs, and, and you name it, um, at the city who have similar uh, retention schedules. And, and we believe that this would be something that would be a place that's required for everyone. And it would be a 
significant investment initially, but would absolutely save uh, save us all. Uh, and this uh, estimate, this is probably the limitation of an existing building to accommodate that. I, I noticed that there's some, you know, right. current building or we did we piece. estimated a new building. Uh, you know, we didn't really consider land acquisition. Bring that up. You know, it was just, you know, under the assumption that maybe there were, you know, I know the the dream would be there was an empty lot behind the DA office. I know that the city did. Uh, so we we didn't consider land acquisition, but uh, basically it's a rough square foot estimate based on the storage needs, uh, and then it, it includes the design soft cost. But, uh, What's the square footage? I don't remember what we estimated off the top of my head. Um, it's based on different, you know, the storage needs. We, we basically took what Iron Mountain, you know, was using and um, and put that as ours needs. So like our, our the, the cubic footage or verse footage? About like 20 thousand. Yeah, that. Yeah. And I know that when we started the conversation with Warren, they they were you know, he sort of dreamed that there might be some open space in the VA. Right, we've got a bunch of unclaimed space there. Um, obviously, we've got a few different operations that are going on in the VA right now that you know could lead to some you know cross contamination or some uh, some safety and access issues, right? But um, yeah, to the extent there is any anything that we can reclaim uh, for this project, I imagine that we could probably get this cost down uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you know, with yeah. um, the deep need for space and possibly uh, having to go in a retrofit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we wanted to make sure that we accounted for that. Yeah, it's it's a higher estimate. You know, we, we it was a, a you know steel frame was reinforcing the building. It was just a little bit bigger. And, and that completes uh, all of our uh, presented proposals. Um, I, I do want to discuss one sort of off docket item. And, and oh, my into the, uh, just back on the storage. Um, in terms of, you know, we, we received a uh, request that we move the storage from the department of cost protection. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a real need across, across the board. Um, in terms of Co-location. You know, you mentioned possible cross contamination within the VA. Uh, do you see any conflict if you were to co-locate with other public safety agencies, like, for instance, the clerks or NFPD? You know? I think that would would absolutely work, and I'll think about that a little bit more. But you know, so long as we've got appropriate control yeah. and, and security at the facility, you know, personnel whose job it is to make sure that that doesn't that I believe that we can absolutely cope with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we have, as our office has been growing, and, and right as we move forward, the VA has always sort of dreamed at being as accessible to community as possible. Um, during the first years of the term, we established satellite offices at, at community libraries to just have a hub where communities could walk up. They don't have to come down to this kind of imposing compound uh, at Tulane and Claude to, to do their business. Um, that was effective. Uh, we've been able to move a number of things uh, to a more virtual format. So now there's no need for some folks who don't have very serious business to go to a location. So we were able to allow some community to, to reclaim some of that space. Very recently, we've started to uh, uh, dream about the idea of having a, a, a civil rights center, uh, a satellite office, or the DA's office, where our civil rights unit that exists to review cold cases and some cases where, you know, first of all, we've got a number of cases we mandatorily need to take a look at because of the Ramos decision where there were not unanimous jurors. Mm -hmm. But there are others where, you know, some of our predecessors may have been a little more heavy-handed on certain convictions. And some of those things are, in many instances, are things we're not prosecuting, but we're certainly not prosecuting seriously. So um, our civil rights division has, you know, made a lot of gains since, since those were instances. In addition to looking back at those cases, they also uh, help us out with expungements and identifying people who are appropriate for other forms of relief. Mm -hmm. We thought if we had some space in community with one that was a little less threatening, it could go a long way to encouraging more people to, to utilize that, that, that asset, right? Um, we had begun conversations with Councilmember Harris and, and public council meetings um, about the Keller Center and, and had them back and forth with property management uh, to 
we can look and break for a moment that we really didn't get access to it, but ultimately there was another uh, community group who had uh, uh, first access, which we absolutely support. Are you um, still working with the library? Um, we, we just pulled our, our last person from libraries uh, over the last couple of weeks, and it was in New Orleans East. Uh, and, and what's, okay, what's the reason? We weren't seeing the foot traffic. You know, we, we were deploying personnel. We were sending an investigator out to kind of just sit there and you know take do intake for anybody who came in. And when we moved to virtual, people just you know I might choose to, to pick up my phone and just see you on Zoom as opposed to, to getting you know put, putting on pants and going to the library. You know? uh, so so we we really saw you know high use at the top, but then whenever the alternative came around, people really started to take advantage of that. So. Um, we, we spoke to some of the council members in those districts about that uh, to make sure that you know they didn't know of a pocket of folks who, who absolutely were hoping to you know use that service and they were they were okay with us reclaiming that space as something where a community a nonprofit could use uh, to serve kids. So uh, we, we made that decision very recently and, and it sort of co-occurred with our, our search for uh, satellite community mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, and so after the Keller Center felt free, we started to look at. at uh, we just called up uh, Rico and said, hey, what can you show us? Uh, he took us to the VA right there at that corner of Ferret and, and, and or Perito and, and Gravity, I guess that is. Um, we looked at that space. Our, our civil rights chief likes it, but we're a long ways away. I mean, we uh, explain the need for uh, health and feasibility study and just to be sure that it is a place that someone can inhabit. Um, AC, you know, all of the, the traffic for the building that's been uh, abandoned for so long. Um, but but we're, we're absolutely in the market and, and would love to continue to pursue that uh, with you guys. So. Can I share very briefly? Please. Just um, so one issue we had with the, the satellite center that we had in, in New Orleans East, we were, we were very grateful for. But the only thing we could really put there was, um, you know, a couple days a week for part of the day, put an adult, adult version there. Mm -hmm. And we did, um, over the course of the pandemic, get to the point where, um, we could meet people you know, by Zoom and they don't have to find childcare right. or transportation because most of our diversion clients are struggling enough as it is. And so it, it, you know, th that actually worked out. We wanted to accommodate that. Um, but also a barrier to using it for um, kind of full-time staff is we could only have access when the library was open. They don't open till 10. Our people start at 8.30. And, you know, and so also a lot of our people, they need access on the weekend to meet with witnesses or victims. So it, that, that was another um, barrier as well. So what we really need is more working space that we could have kind of dedicated all the time um, because we have to be flexible for when people are able to come in and file traffic. So this would be a space dedicated full time for victims. Right, absolutely. Right. Not shared space. Well, and, and as we're looking at Keller, we were absolutely willing to, to uh, we couldn't co-locate because of the, the you know, size of the floor it's plan, small. right, but, but we had already started discussions with uh, youth groups, for instance, who were willing uh, to do some, uh, you know, evening yeah. programming or after school programming, so we're absolutely open to the extent that there's space to co-locate, we're always uh, down for partnership, and because we're already thinking about after-hours programming, like expansion clinics for folks who don't have time to get off work, during the day can you know come and, and you know get the, the tour prepared. Um, we are one hundred percent willing to uh, to share that space. Have you had any conversations with Noel? Uh, you know, no, but that was raised as we were on our last tour of well, Rico to look at both Nord and, and then there had been a mention of school board yeah. space potentially as well. Um, but but absolutely we'll uh, we'll reach out to Larry as soon as we can start yeah. Yeah. start a conversation. Yeah. Um so but thank you guys so much uh, for this opportunity and again for all of the help. Uh, throughout the journey. If anything was in our full or, or doesn't make any sense at all, charge it to me and not the experts I have at the table. Uh, again, I've got our, 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 our director of management officer, our IT director, and our chief accountant here uh, who can respond to any of the specifics uh, that you have. And of course, Jacob, uh, who is our shopman uh, through this process. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, so did you like to add that last project? And, and, and Larry, maybe you could give us a little bit of guidance because since it's still so theoretical, um, we don't have uh, you know any you know, none of it is necessarily concrete right now. Right, right. Um, but but it is something that we certainly like to to plan into the future. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, if you choose to work with it, it's possible that you can go into this, you know, kind of professional to say smoothly, you know, well and so on. Yeah. It, it would be good to have it on, on the record. Yeah, that would be great. And also, I'm going to have a conversation with Warren and Larry to make sure that he makes it to every couple of several departments to the record store. And, um, you know, I think it's obviously a good thing. I think it's time for us to start creating by uh, consolidating and taking control of the city. That's <coughs> Million square feet of stuff that we're not careful of the mess. Um, so when we do that right, um, also you know just from the meetings that we've been having uh, this year with Travis Coleman, uh, you know we're going to take a look at uh, maybe converting CCC to some kind of uh, ethanol storage and liquid storage facility. That's definitely something we want to look at as well in that department. That'd be great. Um, so, yeah, we're getting ready to have to do that. So, I'm trying to start that using planning, consolidate the planning with all its stakeholders so that we can start to understand what you know, the magnitude of the need and you know, the seriousness. So, I'm trying to move forward to address that. So, um, you know, I appreciate the conversation. Warren's a, a real research man. I've learned more about records retention from him and Devin over the last few weeks than, than I ever hoped to know. Right? Uh, but he's, he's put a lot of uh, uh, you know, legwork into mm -hmm. looking at our contract, the city's contract. He also has made some inroads with some of the leadership at Iron Mountain to just start talking you know, about his what our needs are uh, um, and, and, and mentioning that it's unsustainable. So he's, uh, he's really um, uh, a long way down that road and I think can help us all get into that consolidation. And, and it's also past time that we start to think about digitizing the strategy as well. Right, right. Okay, great. Uh, have you guys, one last question. Uh, I know you guys have been funded through LED funds in the past. Law enforcement district bonds. Have you had any conversations with the sheriff about possibly uh, you know, <coughs> issuing a bond sale? That's one way you guys can get revenue to do capital projects as well. So um, just to touch that what's funding too that um, each of all the LED funds is what's funding yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. project is doing. I mean, I'm, 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 I made a note to myself to talk to the sheriff about that. Um, but you know, you guys have needs, the courts have needs, the sheriff has capital needs as well. Um, you know, and with the NSO bond. Up on that, and, and I'm not aware of any discussions since I've been there. But I just transitioned. Yeah, it's there. been a while. It's been, it's been a while since they, you know, had a bond sale. Um, so, uh, you know, you guys could reach out. I'll certainly reach out. But you know, multiple people are reaching out to the sheriff. You know, it helps to enforce the needs of the bond sale, especially you know, the way you see it. Okay, that's all. Great right. insight. Thank you, sir. So uh, just a few next steps on our end. <coughs> we'll be uh, hitting like the through uh, Wednesday of next week. Um, once we complete those meetings, we'll begin developing the, the five-year plan, uh, which uh, will present to the city planning commission on September 13th. Um, that plan will become public the week before the September 5th. Um, once the commission adopts the, the five-year plan, Good. Thank you guys so much. Okay.